This podcast is brought to you by FlexiSpot and their high-quality adjustable standing desks. There are links in the description. To support Moore's Law is Dead, please click on those. And this podcast is also brought to you by CDKeyOffer.com for cheap, reasonably priced Windows keys and gaming software. Use Broken Silicon for 25% off all Windows keys and Dodge Shrink for 3% off everything else. We'll talk about that more later. But for now, let's just get on with the show. Welcome to Broken Silicon, a gaming hardware podcast. I am your host, Tom, and I am joined today as we burn the midnight oil by my co-host, Dan. Yeah, I'm going to apologize just openly to you right now, Dan. We are starting later than usual, and I don't know, I as, you, as often happens, I put more effort into trying to really nail a few points on a video I put out before this. Then I expected I would need to, so I'm I'm sorry, Dan. I'm sorry we're starting so late. I forgive you. All right, good. Well, I will say, though, this is a good time to say, yeah, we, if you are watching or listening to this, you'll probably have noticed this came out half a day late, and that's because we felt it completely necessary to delay the release of this for the 7950X3D reviews. And, you know, it's it's good we did that for two reasons. I'm going to be honest. We'll see what happens by the end of this. But I think this is going to be a shorter than usual episode because were it not for the Zen 4 X3D stuff, I don't know that we would have had that much to talk about. I mean, frankly, this was one of those news cycles where I put out a bunch of mini leaks just because I'm like, it's time to put this out if there's no other news. And also, we need something to talk about on Broken Silicon. So it would have been mostly Moore's Law's dead leaks without this anyways. Yeah, I mean, you know. We had three months worth. We got a year's Maybe, worth of yeah. stuff <laughs> of releases in like three months. So I guess this is the uh, the dead time after that, right? Well, and the and the besides the amount of news, the other good, the other reason it was good we delayed the release of this episode is I think I got the norovirus over the weekend, and so if we were going to record yesterday, I would not have been able to. But it was, you know, what? it's been a rough week for me in general. I got a pretty bad cold. Well, actually, it was a mild one early in the week. And then my girlfriend got sick, really sick. And I was like, oh, well, maybe she just has different symptoms than me because we got sick at the same time. Let me bring her over some like some Vite Ramen and other things to, you know, help her feel good. And you know, then when I was driving home a couple of days ago, I was like, I don't know, I'm starting to feel sick again. And it's like, nope, she didn't have the same sickness with different symptoms. I got a cold. She didn't. Then she got norovirus. Then I did. So I got a cold and norovirus in the same week. And it's That's it's fun. been it's been pretty rough. But yet the content has kept coming, everybody. So. I mean, we need we need to feed them content, Tom. We need to feed the monsters, the Moore's Law's dead monsters, the yeah. monsters living in the dark could maybe yes. be what they stand for in it, instead of Moore's Law's dead. But I'd say let's get into it. It's late. We don't want to waste any time on this one. To the really the main discussion point of this episode, story number one, AMD launches the R9 7950 X3D and retakes the gaming crown. So I have a small write-up here, and then I'll get your opinion on it, Dan. Uh, today, AMD launched the R9 7950X3D, and the gist is as follows. The 7950X3D is the fastest gaming chip, beating the i9-13900KS by 5 to 10% on average, depending on the website or review you read. And even when it, the i9 is using expensive DDR5-7200, Furthermore, AMD seems to win in newer games more often than Intel, with many of Intel's wins being largely in older games that are already getting 400 or 800 frames per second, calling into question if a lot of the wins Intel has really are that important. In fact, in some games like Fight Simulator, a game that many people continually bring up as being CPU bottlenecked, AMD wins by at least 30%. This is a win that matters, not 
getting 860 frames per second in Rainbow Six Siege (laughs) instead of 840. Although it's not all good news for AMD's launch. Some applications do choose the wrong cores at times, and that means that AMD does still have some work to do on its software, just like Intel did after launching Alder Lake. But overall, the biggest takeaway for this writer is the following. Honestly, just wait for the 7800X3D that won't have to worry about scheduling issues, will probably beat the 7950X3D by a few percentage points on average, and will cost much less, or... Just get like the $500 7950X, depending on the deal you're getting at a Micro Center or Newegg, or get like a 7600 that's giving you 80% the performance of this $700 CPU for after a bunch of deals are taken into account. Sometimes it's like a third the price or less. Um, So uh, that's my thoughts. You know, if you want multi threading, the 7950X is a good multi-threading gaming chip. Like it's not bad at gaming all of a sudden. And it yeah. costs less. And if you want game, if you want the best gaming, get the 7800X3D or like the i5 is $280, the 7600X is $240. I, I don't know. That's that my takeaway is all this expensive stuff is like triple the price for 10 to 30% more performance. Who really cares? If, if that. I mean, it's right. I, and, and that might change in the future. There are some games that suggest future engines might be a lot more, but it still costs like two to three times as much. So it's not like you're missing out on price performance, even if that does happen. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, my, my takeaway, um, uh, and I think a big takeaway is just from the fact that they kind of well, they are launching the 7900 x3d at the same time i guess but they're not letting you review it which i think speaks says everything about the 7900 x3d something tells me it's going to be a shittier 50 i mean not 50 7600 x in a lot of way in gaming in a lot of ways and i don't know i i'm, I'm not confident in the 7900 x3d and then they're delaying the 7800 x3d presumably so they can you, upsell you or something. You buy the 7950X3D or 7900X3D instead. Uh, but I was ultimately... My ultimate takeaway from the 7950X3D reviews was that you shouldn't really get the 7950X3D even if it, by all means, is a powerful CPU. It's just in this weird space where it's not that well... Um, now, I don't want to say it's not well optimized. It's not, it doesn't uh, schedule very well in some tasks. So you get worse performance than like a 7700X in some tasks. Uh, it, but if you disable the non VCAST die, uh, that is completely reversed. And now it's stronger than anything on the market. <laughs> um, which, you know, I think says that the 7800X3D is just going to be, my, by miles, the best gaming CPU you can get when it actually comes out. And this is like some weird in-between where it's kind of better than the 7950X in gaming, uh, but it's worse at productivity. So it's like, I, I feel like if you need this uh, a PC for productivity, you're presumably doing it for work. And I think most people would rather sacrifice a few frames to have higher productivity than the reverse of that. If they're making money off of their PC, does that make sense? No, that's exactly what I think, (laughs) you know, and I had to make this decision last year when I saw a five, nine 50 X going for $470 and the 5,800 X 3d was Typically about three fifty to four hundred. Um, this was right before the prices got the lowest. Uh, although I guess I still probably got a good deal on that sixteen core. And I said, yeah, you know, I need the cores, and it loses in gaming by ten to thirty percent. But it's not like this is bad at gaming. And now we're in a situation where it's thirty percent better at gaming for both. So it's like, what? game do you really care that much about with this 16 core i i don't know it, it's the good multi-threading gaming hybrid chip is still the 7950x you know because it just it, it doesn't matter you know like exactly it's, we're not in the world the way i put it in the video uh, i've just put out is we're not in this world of you're, you're like choosing between a 7700k and a broadwell e 
Mm-hmm. Everything out now can do multi-threading okay and gaming really well. So who like you're you really choose the one you want because you're not actually making a big sacrifice in the other department anymore in almost any scenario. Yeah, I, I mean it's almost the uh, like the takeaway every time when the uh, most powerful gaming CPU, nominally most powerful gaming CPU comes out. It's weirdly almost always a little underwhelming because it's like, yeah, I, I see on paper, I, I have nothing on paper really against the X, the 7950X3D. It's just, who's this for? Get the 7950X if you need it to make money. Get the 5800X3D if you need good gaming performance. 7800X3D. No, I didn't misspeak. But- Oh, okay. <laughs> and you want to save some money or okay sorry or wait two months and get the 7800 x3d if you want the best gaming cpu on the market because like based on um hardware and box uh review where they simulated the 7800 x3d I, and i see no reason why the actual thing would be any worse than that um it's going to kill everything mm-hmm. well <laughs> on average you know- the one argument I can make for the 7950X3D and maybe the 7900X3D, which I want to be clear, yeah, I think that's for no one. I, I really do. Like, unless, and I suspect that's going to drop in price in a few months. And I, I, oh, <laughs> if that got below 500, that's when it's interesting. But um, I mean, my prediction for the 7900X3D is you're going to have something worse in productivity than the 7900X in gaming performance of like, Probably a 5800X3D, maybe a little worse. I mean, um, you know? <laughs> well, it still has the same amount of cache, I believe, on the six core V cache okay. CCD as the 7950X3D. So I would actually suspect mm, in most games okay. it's the same performance because it has two less cores, same amount of cache. But there will be the remote scenario where, yeah, it loses by five to 10%. But I, I think it'll, I think it'll be, okay. you know, that. Um, the the one argument though I could make for the 7950X3D is it is insanely efficient. <laughs> like oh, yes, did you yeah. see that link to the tech power up uh review where um it, it's in the note stand where it uses less than half the power of Intel's chip most of the time gaming. This chip is so efficient at gaming. It's ridiculous oh, yeah. and multi-threading to the point where I'd go eh, honestly the 7950X3D maybe kind of makes sense for like small form factor builds that's the only truly unique thing i can think of well because um i'm trying to remember if my memory serves correctly it was using on average like it was using on average like 20 watts or something less than the non v counterpart right yes i I mean there's definitely something to it that i i guess it makes sense now thinking about it but there's definitely something to it where like this is also surprisingly just a more power efficient cpu than anything on the market although to go back to the 7800 x3d i don't see a reason why that would be any different uh or why that wouldn't be more so the case uh than with the 7950 x3d yeah and you know ultimately uh the conclusion i came to uh is I think the 7950X3D just makes the i9s look really stupid. Like, you have this chip that requires at least $100 more in RAM costs, more expensive cooling, and you're pushing everything to the limit to still come in second place. I said, it's like if there was a guy on steroids who destroyed his body to still lose the bodybuilding competition (laughs) to someone who just has a normal, healthy body. (laughs) Like, and... Just because of that, though, that doesn't mean I recommend the 7950X3D really outside of, I guess, top of the line, small form factor builds. Uh, I'll say I think that's actually an interesting argument there. Um, I just want to throw this at you. Well, let's get to some of the reader mails because that'll come up what I want to say in here. Uh, QH Freddy writes in and says, feels like an extra F you to consumers to launch the janky 7950X3D first and make everyone wait another month. For the 7800X3D, that's actually going to work. Well, in the averages, it still wins in gaming by like 5 to 10%, depending on... So even with the times it doesn't work, the averages, it still beats Intel. So I think calling that janky is a bit much. But 
I do agree that the 7800X3D should have come out first. Like if it's scheduled perfectly, the upsell argument makes sense to me from a business perspective. But uh, why not put because I honestly think no one would have complained about the 7950X3D if the 7800X3D was already out, because there would have been like a month of the 7800X3D getting glowing reviews, being the best gaming chip. Then this 16 core model would have come out and they'd say, hey, in a couple of games it has issues, but it's still 95% the performance and now you get multi-threading. It would have been viewed through the lens of it being an extra option, whereas now the 8 mm. core is viewed as the extra option. And I, I do think that the 8 core for sure should have come out first, if anything, to give them more time to work on the software. Uh, yeah, that's a fair point. I uh, Hopefully this improves over time. And to be fair, from the reviews I looked at, it did seem to be, if I'm remembering correctly, it was somewhat reviewer dependent on which games had issues, uh, which makes me wonder if there's something wrong with uh, certain BIOSes that are being pushed for the 7950X3D. But at the end of the day, I think the games that have issues are seem to mostly be outliers and I don't see why they wouldn't be fixed uh, at In some the point with software updates. There's no, there's no reason. Like, I can't. I, if I'm remembering correctly, it was like uh, Rainbow Six uh, was having issues where it was getting like worse. Performance. I think Counter Strike did too. Yeah, where it was like getting worse performance than like a 7600. Tomb Raider was one of them, I believe, as well. If I remember correctly. Yeah, Which but then if, these are all older games. But then if you disable the uh non vcas uh, oh, yeah. ccd oh it's now the best performing cpu on the market so it's like well i don't see a reason why that couldn't be fixed through a software update and yeah it does make early reviews <laughs> it does make early reviews for the 7950x3d look worse so if they just wanted like from the ultimate like positive review standpoint the 7800x3d i think would have been a little bit better but uh, they want you to spend seven hundred dollars, not five hundred. Well, I just look at it the same way as Alder Lake. I or four fifty, not five hundred. Alder Lake had a handful of games not scheduled correctly as well, That's and true. in fact, some games you couldn't even play online because there was DRM issues with the e cores. And I still recommended Alder Lake over Zen Three. I was like, this will be fixed, and this is gonna have teething issues for the first few months. But the average still destroys Zen Three. Same here. The average still beats Raptor Lake with many benefits, including efficiency and RAM costs to boot with it. So I just don't see it as a very major issue. And frankly, from what I've heard, Little Phoenix is going to have two Zen Four cores and four Zen Four C cores, and. Zen 5 is likely to have many hybrid core models, and Zen 6 is, I think, going in an entirely <clears throat> new direction. So I think AMD knew they had to do this eventually. Eventually, yeah. they had to get good at scheduling this, and just like with Intel and Alder Lake, this was always going to happen. Uh, that's not to say that we just forgive it, but it is to say it doesn't seem any different than Alder Lake to me. Yeah, I, I Ultimately, I think it's just kind of s slightly sours and otherwise pretty good launch and a launch that could have been a lot better if they would have just, I think, you know, launched all three of the CPUs at the same time. But mm -hmm. um, so I think we answered Sparkboy's question with that, with what I just said. But let me move on then to JK Software, who writes in and says, hello, Tom and Dan. One thing after seeing all of the reviews of X3D today. It makes me wonder why AMD did not put 3D vCache on both CCDs rather than just one. It seems to me that performance could have been more consistent. If, well, it would have absolutely been more consistent if that was the case. So I actually, my answer to this suggestion is completely sidestepping it. I don't think they should have launched it. I agree. I, I, mean, I think just launch the 7800X 3D, take the gaming crown like you did last gen, and then... uh you know, you just have this other thing out there. Or, or you just price all of your higher core count models where they are now. More competitive than Raptor, like, oh, most of the time. Yeah. Why I, do you I, need this thing? I, I Maybe it's just because the, they want the existence of the upsell to be there. Uh, so, like, you get the people that always want the most expensive thing. And, oh, we're getting the best performance with that, too, I guess. But I, I, I think there is something to, like... 
it would look really good on a slide for uh, for consu- to consumers if the best gaming CPU on the market right now were four hundred fifty dollars. Even if you know AMD still has a bunch of C- a few CPUs above that uh, tier, because they also are selling those to people who use their PC for work. Well, you want to know another funny thing? Uh, before Zen 4 was even out, and to this day, I am told that they have Zen 4 CCDs, yields of them, that hit 5.9 gigahertz easy. Uh, well, I wouldn't say easy. I mean, these are mm-hmm. the best yields. Um, but they decided to mostly use those um, either for Epic or soon for Dragon Range or in the X3D models just to keep the overall voltage lower as well. And I can't help but think, yeah, why not just launch a 7850X3D and then launch a 7950XT or whatever they want to call it that instead of going to 5.7 gigahertz, it's maybe 6 gigahertz. It would lose to the 7800X3D in gaming, but it would still add that extra like 4% in multi-threading to probably tie the i9. Mm-hmm. I, I can't, and, and some of this is maybe shoulda, coulda, woulda. And maybe this will sound like an utterly you know, out of date conversation in two months when they fix all software scheduling issues. That's probably going to happen, but I still can't help but wonder that like in the top end, they just want the multi-threading performance most. Maybe you should have just launched a six gigahertz chip. And then over here is the best gaming chip for less money. That That's yep. my opinion is what I think they should have done. Yeah. And then I think we're at to, uh, to more directly answer his question, like why wouldn't they have CCD? I mean, uh, the cash on both CCDs, uh, to go to your productivity, because right. They would have been sacrificing productivity even more. So like you Mm -hmm. lose like five to 10% on benchmarks. Now, I don't know, maybe that goes to like 15% on a lot of benchmarks. If you have CC, uh, V cash on both CCDs and, I don't think you would really be getting that much better gaming performance on a 7950X3D with two uh, VCAS CCDs versus one. Like, no, I th- that, that's I, what I they think, said. I think is the, it didn't help. The, in an interview recently, they said it didn't help gaming performance at all. So we felt it was best to just boost multi threading 5 to 10%. Yeah. I, I mean, with this, you're basically just buying two 7800Xs, one X3D and one, not, and one X. Like, that's kind of what the 7950X3D is. Because you don't need both CCDs for gaming at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it, there's an argument that they could have done that. It still would have been an interesting product if they did do that, to be fair, uh, especially because that one would have probably been like 95 watts and that <laughs> really could have been the small form factor king. Yeah. And maybe that would have made it an interesting product on its own, but at least the decision was cost a little less. And frankly, this gets you more multi threading. So, and again, if they never fix the scheduling, then we'll know that's what they should have done. But in two months, if they do, yeah. I mean, it still is a pretty rare that you run into issues at launch, just like Alder Lake. So I have a feeling they'll fix it. Um, Falto writes in and says, after the launch of the 3D models, what does Intel have to combat them? If I remember correctly, Meteor Lake desktop was canceled. What about the alleged Raptor Lake refresh? How powerful and power hungry would they be? And as a hypothetical, can they die shrink Raptor Lake uh, to Intel for, uh, well, they're not. So <laughs> I'll just answer that. The real question you're asking are, is there a reason they would, or will they? No, they won't. Um, I mean, you know, I think with Raptor Lake refresh, the best you're going to see is a 5% boost. And re- keep in mm-hmm. mind what that would mean. A 6.3 gigahertz chip. I find it unlikely they can go above that easily. So they're not going to beat AMD. It's that simple. I mean, I think that the, we already have the answer and that's the ks right um maybe you could go another step further than the ks and make a kss or (laughs) or Or maybe not call it that (laughs) i don't know what the hell they would call it but maybe you could go a step further than that but i think it would just have the same issues that the 13900 ks has but more so so yeah and i think it's worth pointing out I don't doubt that maybe they could do a slight optimization to the architecture that allows yeah. higher clocks at lower power, maybe make some real tweaks. I, I, I think that is quite possible. That's what they're doing. But 
I mean, the i9-13900KS already arguably doesn't even get more performance than the K. It just uses less energy at higher clock speeds <laughs> and can use faster RAM. Yeah. Like, so I just find it unlikely they can boost this by more than 5%, and AMD wins by at least 5%. So the answer is, I mean, the best we can hope for right now, based on my understanding, is that Intel launches an i5-14600K meteor like chip with six big cores eight little cores and that hopefully that gets over five gigahertz and brings a decent ipc increase and i think that could tie zen 4x 3d will be in like 350 and if they do that i kind of like that product a lot why do we always need these 300 watt ridiculous chips my video today was half talking about all these top (laughs) chips are stupid like i don't have a problem with intel only launching an i5 that matches or beats zen 4x 3d that's the best you're going to get they'll lose multi-thread so yeah and I guess for the time being, people getting uh, Raptor like systems are going to have to deal with the terrible 400 frames per second in Rainbow Six versus 430 yeah. frames per second because I uh, at 1080p because uh, that that <laughs> a lot of in coil wine like, mode. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, does it really? Do we really need it yet? I almost think we just need a year of games becoming more optimized how powerful our hardware is before we even address what we need um zach writes in and he says hey tom and dan i've recently been playing hogwarts legacy and i've been reading complaints about the performance on forums when browsing through the comments i've noticed plenty of people saying things along the lines of but i've got a 12900k or 5800 x3d i should be able to play this easy and I've got an old 8-core Broadwell Xeon with an ARC 6800 that had zero issues. Do you believe there is far too much emphasis on CPUs for gaming? Yeah. And there has been for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I think that's been like one of the three lines of this channel or this podcast, at least, is us talking about how CPUs are hair splitting at the top end, where it's like the new, the new gaming performance crown king of CPUs. Two percent more than what you had before. <laughs> I know it's just, and then the, yeah, there will be flight simulator where seven nine fifty X three D just wins by an insane margin, or <laughs> like in yeah. the factorial, it's like a forty or fifty percent win. <laughs> like, yeah, there's a couple games where that happens, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, but those wins are now hitting like crazy. Besides flight simulator, that one matters. It's the one that matters. Um, you know, a lot of these games, even when they get big games are like way, well over 200 frames per second. And I'm like, I, do you have a monitor that's actually above 240 Hertz? I, I don't know. I, I think a lot of people, um, when it comes to Harry Potter, I'm guessing there's a lot of people without enough Ram or fast enough Ram number mm-hmm. one and number two. Yeah. They're probably pairing a 3060 with a, you know, really fast I seven or something. And then on top of that, they don't realize they bought a mid-range or lower mid-range graphics card from three years ago, and they're surprised they need to run it at medium settings. You know, it's like, yeah, this it's been three years. Now you have to turn down settings. If you don't want to turn down settings, you get a flagship. I mean, yeah, I don't own Hogwarts Legacy, but it looks like it's a, graphically a pretty impressive game, and it's also not the best optimized game. So to a certain extent, I don't know what people are expecting. Like, sorry, you can't get 120 frames per second in every game with every card. It seems to like be that's becoming the complaint. And you know, maybe Zach is fine with his performance because he has realistic expectations about <laughs> what he'll get for with a 6800. Although 6800 still a great graphics card, but <laughs> yeah. Um, although now it, I mean, now it's like 400 bucks, so. It's yeah, like, well, but I bought this, you know, whatever. And it's like, well, yeah, but now it's no, but I'm adding on to what you're saying. Yeah, like, yeah. But now it's a $400 card. And so it's mid range. And yeah, you can just t- turn down some settings, turn on FSR and still probably play around 4K 100 with the right settings in that game. That's known <laughs> to not be optimized. I, I don't know to, uh, people what your expectations were. The Forbidden Juice writes in and says, Hello, Tom and Dan. I have a 7950X that runs at more or less full workload all the time. From my perspective, Hardware Info 64 over a 118-hour window shows averages of 97.8%, so I'm not exaggerating. 
I don't, because I have such a workload as a, oh, so he's using it like an HDDG chip. He's saying it's running flat out 24 seven. He says, I value power efficiency quite a bit. And hearing you talk about the people with crazy hot takes on the i9 13900KS got me thinking, how many people realize the effects of power savings on the cost of a CPU? I ran some numbers and found that my CPU with eco mode enabled runs at about 144 watts average uh, in this window. And if I look at what the 13900K does to get similar performance, about 295 watts based on Gamers Nexus's numbers, the electrical cost of running either machine at my cost of 10 cents per kilowatt hour, the 7950X costs about $10 per month to run versus $21 per month for the 3900K. And over the course of a year, that's $124 in savings for the 7950X. So why would anyone get the 3900K or KS for all core workloads with that sort of power cost? And if you're getting one not for all core workloads, well, that seems silly to me. Why did you buy this thing with so many cores? Also, I have a pretty cheap power compared to others. A lot of people have 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Anyways, thought that'd be some good perspective for you to use as ammunition against the crazy takes on the 13900KS that seems to keep going around recently. Yeah, um, I, just... <laughs> I don't know. There's some YouTube channels giving horrible advice who think you should spend more money for something that wins in gaming. Again, wins in gaming versus the 7950X by 5% after spending an extra $100 on RAM, getting a crazy cooler. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I don't yeah, know. It, it's been a weird thing for a while. Um, I, I, really, the entire time I feel like I've been uh, doing PC gaming, Sometimes, for some comparisons, kill, uh, power usage matters. Sometimes they don't. And sometimes people overemphasize power usage and sometimes they don't. Like, if we're talking about a graphics card and one's using like 160 and the other is using 180, I don't think it matters that much. But yeah, when you're using, when you're talking about double power usage almost on a 24 seven rig, that's going to be, that's going to add up. Like, I just looked up in my area. Yeah, it's, Kilowatt hours here in uh, Massachusetts are uh, thirty or almost thirty cents per kilowatt hour right now, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, <laughs> so that for me, if I were doing something similar here, that would be like what three hundred dollars a year. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> but yeah, th again, and that kind of brings it all full circle. That is why I'm like seventy eight hundred X three D seven nine fifty X or like seventy seven hundred i five. 13600K yeah. i7. I saw a deal on Micro Center. You can get the i7 13700K for $400 with a free one terabyte Gen 4 SSD. Like these things here, if you're wanting the best gaming performance, that's the 7800X3D. If you want multi threading, I don't think you care about the extra 10 to 30%. Just get the 7950X3D. I mean, the 7950 non X3D. Um, mm -hmm. And because you got that, you're using all of the cores without burning your power budget. I know the i9s trade blows in multi-threading, but I assume you're going to use all those 24 cores if you're buying this thing. Otherwise, I don't know why you're buying this thing. And if you are, that means, yeah, it's going to like use as much energy as Threadripper. So, so just get the 7950X and lose 5% in gaming, okay, guys? And then yeah. otherwise, if all that starts to sound weird to you, and it probably should for most of you, then get the $200 CPUs that give you 90% of the performance and come with free <laughs> RAM. Like, I, I don't know. A, a lot of this seems like ridiculous arguments to me. This piece of content is brought to you by FlexiSpot and their roster of high-quality, adjustable standing desks. Many of you have noted that Dan, co-host of Broken Silicon, could use some upgrades to his workspace. And, well, we think that the first step so far is going to be getting him a high-quality desk, and one was provided by FlexiSpot. And honest to God, Dan does report that this thing is incredibly high-quality. Which, yeah, their desks are made with high-quality bamboo that allows for incredible weight support and durability against all types of would-be destroyers. And they also come with an advanced one-touch LED control panel with three programmable buttons for different height levels. And you can customize your desk with your preferred color, size of desktop, and desk frame. They have many options. FlexiSpot desks also come with quiet motors that make them ideal for adjustments while you're working from home. And they also come with a five-year warranty on the desk frame and two-year warranty on the control panel and electronics. Click the links in the description depending on what region you're in to support Moore's Law is Dead. Just clicking on on these links alone helps the channel a lot and you can extra support us by buying one of these desks through those links if you actually need a high quality adjustable standing desk because you know if you do this is honestly a good choice buy flexi spot today
Um, all right. I think then we should move on finally to story number two. AMD is still not launching Threadripper for possibly a year. Moving on from tons of cash to tons of cores, Threadripper, with the launch of Sapphire Rapids Workstation Platforms now, or I think actually in a month, technically, Intel's weird, many gamers are wondering if they should be waiting for AMD to launch their 96 core Zen 4 Workstation Platform based on Genoa, or even a potential budget 32 core Zen 4 HDT platform based on the Sienna platform. And the answer, at least from this channel, is not really. Recently, Moore's Law is Dead leaked that the updates provided last year regarding Threadripper's release window haven't changed. We're going to be lucky to see a launch of a 96-core Threadripper platform in quarter four of this year, and apparently it's very likely it won't even launch until early next year. Furthermore, the 3D Vcash versions of Zen 3 for Threadripper do not sound like they're planned at all, and any budget version of Threadripper based on the Sienna platform seems to be coming in the distant future not preempting the 96 core expensive workstation platform. So if Milan based Threadripper Zen 3 uh, Threadripper Pro isn't the right product for you now and Sapphire Rapids looks tempting and you could make use of it well now, get that yeah. now because you'll probably be waiting a year for AMD's answer to that. And it will be really good, but it's going to be expensive as well. I see no reason to wait. So I don't know. What do you think about this news, Dan? It's not completely new, but it is kind of new in that I think there's been a lot of rumors swirling and I asked around. And it's like, nope, it's it's still coming quite a distance in the future. I mean, there's Zen 4 right there. Their thread rippers have te- uh, platforms have tended to release about a year after their desktop for a few generations. A year or right? never <laughs> lately. Yeah. You, you, have they skipped the gen? Oh, yeah, they did. Didn't they? Basically, yeah. I yeah. mean, they have the pro version of Zen 3. Uh, but that came that's out a, way that's, late. That's only o- available through OEMs, though, still. Isn't not it? anymore. Now not it's anymore? on Newegg. Okay. But it came to Newegg as of, like, I think late last year. So it, it did come out way late. There's still no Zen 3D versions of it for Threadripper either. I would take that as basically they missed a generation because they kind of put it out for Pro and there's no 3D. I and mean, then, my, my guess based on benchmarks... It, uh, what I'm saying is it used to be a few months after the original launch at most. Yeah, and it's slowly lagged later and later as i think they realize that threadripper is a less and less important platform to their bottom line you know yeah i think zen 1 and zen plus were like within a month of the original release and then zen 2 is mo- a few months later and then it was a year later only for pro and now it's like over a year later possibly <laughs> yeah i uh, i i mean i think based on what we saw from the sapphire rapids benchmarks at least compared to epic I, 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 which I know is a different platform, but it seems like uh, even AMD's older uh, archi- server architecture still hold up pretty well against Sapphire Rapid. So I'm guessing there's just not much of a reason to really respond this quickly to Sapphire Rapids unless they need, <laughs> there's not really a reason for them to respond at this point. Might as well push it off for a year and, you know, make more money in desktop and epic whenever epic comes out but (laughs) there's definitely got to be a component to what's going on that of course is amd saying we'll make more money selling this to epic and we can't supply enough epic but i do think you can't under i do think it's a little underemphasized the supply part of it Mm. what i was told recently that zen 3 epic is still ramping up like they're still oh. ordering more of them per month, even though Zen 4 is out. So like when someone's like, well, why didn't they launch Zen 3 Epic to Threadripper until way later? And why is it only in the workstation? It's because, guys, they have almost no supply for you. And they're <laughs> over 30% server market share. And every analyst I talk to, and there's like a new one every week, by the way, says they think AMD is going to hit over 40% server market share this year. And if they do, they are set for the next decade. Mm-hmm. And a lot of customers are also complaining about lead times for Epic products. Like they're annoyed that they can order a Xeon and it just gets there within a month. And then they order from AMD and they're like, there's a six month lead time to delivery. I think AMD would rather not add another plate to try to spin on one of its hands and just make mm-hmm. sure they perfectly take market share and server this year. It's a very unsatisfying answer to enthusiasts, but that's what it is. I don't even think it's, it's not just making more money. 
uh, per chip is that they don't have the supply kind of, and also they just don't think it's important, relatively speaking. They they just want to nail execution for their server customers. Well, I, I mean, right? Uh, uh, these CPUs are, the CPUs themselves are going to utilize a lot of the same resources as Epic will, and they just don't make as much money. <laughs> and, and when you so. say it's resources, uh, not like the components, like just the the marketing team, the logistics, the same yeah. people, you know. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. It's uh, and I do think there's just this argument that the high end of a uh, desktop is still at this point kind of in a pseudo HEDT place at this point. So there's just less and less need for this weird middle market that Threadripper occupied when it initially came out there's less need and amd is just a fit the size of intel and they've realized <laughs> their limitations yeah. i think yeah um florida man writes in and he says there's a lot of negative feedback on amd not supporting strx4 third ripper socket long term as promised as this cast out on amd's promise for am5 support in many people's eyes would it not be easy for them to launch some non-pro threadripper 5000 and call it a day if not, why? And if so, why haven't they done it already? Uh, I don't actually have a good answer for you. If I was there, I would say, yeah, we shouldn't waste our time doing a full lineup. But ultimately, we've already launched the Pro, so we can definitely support that. It, guys, let's launch one five nine nine five x you know, 164 core to the standard socket. And I'd even say 132 X3D core, you know, to the standard socket. And that's it. You don't need to even do the full lineup. 164, 132 core, and just call it a day so you can say you fulfilled your promises. I honestly think it's still worth it for them to do that. Uh, I, I, It's a little too late to bother at this point, but I think they should have. I mean, I generally think it's not good to go back on promises, but my guess is like this goes back to the previous conversation we were having is... This is just isn't as important of a platform for them as their other ones. And they are letting it go to the wayside, even if it's kind of betraying customers or mm -hmm. which, yeah, that's bad, um, especially in an environment where AMD has lost some of its trust over the past several months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I don't really, really anything else to say about it besides that. <laughs> um, yeah. NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wang writes in. Oh, wow. Wow. He said, mm -hmm. will Sapphire Rapids follow up actually be cheaper than Sapphire Rapids, given it's moving to two chiplet tiles? So, yeah, he's talking about the Granite Rapids uh, HED well, workstation platform, which I'm told is going to be one IO die uh, and then two... It, up to two CPU tiles. So yeah, that'd be three tiles total. Uh, or they could even just do one 44 core tile with one IO die if they want to skimp even more. Um, yeah, I, I think it actually will be. Look, at the end of the day, guys, Intel's 10 nanometer node was built with the mindset that no one's going to be able to touch us for a decade. And so if we get this out in even the next five years, we'll cr crush everyone and charge mm -hmm. more money. Then it took them a decade to launch it. And it's not bad. I mean, 10 nanometer is pretty competitive with seven and even six nanometer. But it costs more. It was. It's not a cost-effective node. I'm directly told Intel Four will probably just cost less per wafer. <laughs> so there's no way around it. Intel wants to get to Intel Four now. Yeah. Like it, it, they need to. Um, and because they're be overall using a more economical node, and uh, that I'm told at a minimum won't cost more than 10 nanometer, and because they're using less tiles in Granite Rapids workstation, yeah. They can kind of have to be cheaper. <laughs> yeah, I think they can make it cheaper if they want to. Uh, QH Freddy writes in and he says, it feels like this hasn't been asked for a good year or so. So here we go. Are we stagnating at 16 cores? No. Intel has a 24 core and we're talking about the release of 80 to or 86 core Granite Rapids and 96 core Threadripper. I don't think we're stuck at 16 cores at all. I just think AMD launched 16 cores for three generations in a row and they're going to move up core counts next year and during those 16 core generations they didn't up performance by 10 percent zen 3 added like 20 to 30 percent zen 4 added 30 to 60 <laughs> or something <laughs> so they're not upping core counts but 
I don't think Skylake added 50% performance to Haswell last time I checked in multi-threading. No. So I, I, I don't think this is stagnation. And frankly, we're still seeing so many games not even utilize the cores correctly. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I feel like uh, I feel like the past three generations we've had on with 16 cores on, on AMD, uh, they've kind of just been fixing the issues that are, were present in the Zen architecture that needed to be addressed at some point. And hopefully next uh, generation will, I mean, I presume will go, would be up to 24 cores. I don't know if there's a chance of it doubling, but. Yeah, I, I think, it's, the, I think the, it's a little complicated. I, I'm, I'm trying to, I've gotten some information on it recently, but I, I want to confirm it before I leak it. I don't want any mess ups anymore on exactly what's going on. I, I mean, cause yeah, the two scenarios I could imagine is they add, they move to three chiplets or they move to CCDs with, 16 cores or something but yeah so <laughs> I, I think that's what you're looking at and you know it, it all makes sense instead of doing radical 10 things at once architecture upgrades amd has been doing okay we moved we got chiplets working all right well now let's work to 16 cores with an io die oh we got that working now let's fix all of the latency and ipc issues that's n3 then four clock speeds mm-hmm. <laughs> zen five We've done clock speeds, chiplets. We've done all this other stuff. We've even integrated graphics and are adding accelerators. Now we can move on to the new architecture now that we've gotten practice with all the other stuff. Um, All right. Now let's move on then to story number three. Why NVIDIA feels okay constricting supply? Well, AMD needs market share this year. All right. So I've got to write up here kind of summarizing several links. Over the past couple of weeks, there have been a series of leaks and analyses videos out of Moore's Laws Dead that highlight the following. NVIDIA is constricting 4090 supply in order to push people towards buying the much maligned RTX 4080 that continues to languish on store shelves. Furthermore, NVIDIA's recent earnings point to a boatload of constrained Lovelace and Ampere inventory, as leaked by this channel before, by the way, that NVIDIA indeed seems to be trickling out back and forth between different product types of this gen and last gen in an attempt to avoid any pricing collapses on any of their products. Meanwhile, AMD has extra inventory as well, but far less than NVIDIA. Their earnings tell the truth, and this leaves NVIDIA open to AMD possibly taking market share this summer if AMD were to launch a proper lineup with all of its volume before NVIDIA gives up on its shenanigans and dumps the rest of their products at reasonable pricing. So AMD basically has to do this, though, because they have bought up a ton of RDNA 3 capacity at TSMC, and they can't really use it for anything else but gaming, whether in laptop or desktop, because it, people don't want data center AMD chips besides like MI250X, but that's not what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do want NVIDIA. See, NVIDIA is risking AMD doing this, though, because NVIDIA can continue to supply their oversupplied dies into data center at half off, which would still be like three grand. AMD can't. So, yeah, all that's to say... This is why AMD dumped RDNA 2 at lower prices before NVIDIA did. They have to dump it first because they can't just sell it to data center if something goes wrong. NVIDIA can, but this also means that once they use up a lot of this RDNA 2 supply that's probably going to be gone within a couple months, AMD also kind of has to price RDNA 3 competitively because they bought up all the supply and they can't use it anywhere but gaming. Um, and this means that NVIDIA does continue to play a risky game, but it's understandable why they do, because they do have alternatives AMD doesn't. So I don't know. I thought this was really interesting, like, what came out uh, also with, like, NVIDIA's current market share probably in gaming versus AMD in graphics, and, like, kind of explaining why these companies have to take different approaches or why it makes sense for them to. I I don't know. Did you? This is really, like, a series of stories over the past two weeks I've amalgamized together do you have any thoughts on any of this you know i just have to uh, wonder um at a certain point i feel like amd is just having going to have to sell through you know or the their uh their partners that sell that actually sell their gpus for them at some point are just going to have to sell through the stocks they have and amd needs to start supplying them at or at least supplying stuff like uh, the 7900 XT and maybe the rest of the RDNA 2 lineup at lower stocks to clear out their stock before 
NVIDIA. At lower prices. Yeah, sorry, at lower prices. Uh, so NVIDIA can, uh, before NVIDIA just decides to dump the rest of Ampere that they have. Because that, I just think that's a ticking time bomb that if AMD doesn't uh, dump the rest of their stock bef- uh, that they have to dump before uh, uh, NVIDIA dumps Ampere, uh, is going to completely screw over AMD. Like, uh, <laughs> There, I think that's just this ticking time bomb in the market that's waiting, and both of companies are kind of playing a game of chicken to some extent. They are, and you know the fact that Nvidia's, and I've heard this from multiple people that Nvidia's doing supplying more Lovelace data center cards than they did with Ampere, and at really reduced prices if you buy even two of them at once. By the way, Dan, let me know if you want a RTX 6000 for (laughs) $3,800. Like, and then they're like not supplying 4090s just to push the 4080. Like, that tells you right there, NVIDIA knows they have a problem, right? And they're playing a very risky game here. Uh, Again, but I think I think they feel like they have to as well, because, you know, AMD makes a 10 to 20 percent margin on these chips they're dumping with rdna2 let's say that's what they're making i've heard they could be for some of them uh whatever most of their profit comes from server Mm -hmm. uh an epic i don't think nvidia nvidia can't do that like a lot of the recent data center actually they have way more data center market share than amd but also a lot of the recent data center sales that you're seeing on their earnings is clearly sales to miners (laughs) oh (laughs) like yeah so there's just no way around it that like at the end of the day, NVIDIA makes its money from gaming for the most part, at least a plurality. If AMD's gaming GPU margins drop to 10% for half a year, whatever, that's not most of their revenue. If NVIDIA's do, uh-oh, that's the revenue. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, I guess I don't know how much of that that breaks down to uh data center that isn't mining, I suppose, because y- you know. NVIDIA does have pretty much the entire market when it comes to like machine learning as far as or not the entire market, but oh, yeah. a lot of the market well, when it comes to machine learning. Using a GPU, like a di- yeah, discrete one, yeah. Yeah. So I, I I it's always hard to gauge how big that is compared to everything else, but that's kind of where all of Silicon Valley is seemingly moving right now, or that's at least the giant fad in Silicon Valley right now is machine learning. So (laughs) I'm Mm -hmm. assuming they're making a lot of money through there as well. And that has to be a decent source of revenue for, or or a consistent source of revenue for them at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess, you know, we'll just have to see if AMD screws this up or not but uh, i i I, after my recent video came out too not the one from before today but the one about um why amd is forced to go for gpu market share this year i was told by people that didn't even consult on that video that you know amd is going to price the rest of their lineup pretty aggressively the only Mm. problem i have is who knows if they think 700 dollars for the 7800 xd is aggressive they might say it is but I would suggest that means some of these are going to be pretty close to previous generation MSRP pricing. Uh, yeah. And they just, they, they have to be. And ultimately, these cards, like, again, the 7600 XT costs less to make than the 6600 XT. No reason they can't make that $300, let alone $350. The 7800 XT probably costs less to make than the old 6800 XT because it uses Navi 32. This could be 600 And if they do it, uh, this was the more inter- one of the more interesting parts of my recent video as well. I think uh, if they do it, there is a lot of evidence AMD sells out their cards if they're just priced thirty percent below Nvidia. I think AMD has insisted recently for the past couple generations will be ten percent less than Nvidia, not a cent more because it doesn't matter. It does matter. It seems like you have the mind shared out AMD. We're like, look, you don't need to make it half the price like you did in the past. You do have to make it thirty percent less, and if you do it, you can take a boatload of market share. Yeah, I, I I would and I would say uh, the beginning of like if they price the seventy eight hundred XT for uh, six hundred fifty dollars, the same price as the sixty eight hundred XT to my memory, like that that would be that would be I think mark aggressive, uh, and hopefully they go lower than that and go for something like six hundred. But I'm not crossing my fingers that. <laughs> That prices for any GPU are going to be lower than the their uh, 
uh, prior generation counterpart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And that's why I don't double down. Uh, I think some people sometimes take statements I make to mean this has to happen. I'm not saying it has to happen. I'm just telling you the 7800 XT will cost less to make than the 6800 XT. <laughs> I can't promise you they'll do anything. Just just like Intel. Like when I said, well, Arc's losing money below like $290. And then they're like, but they may, now it's 250 Yep, they're losing money on it. So <laughs> like, what do you want me to say? I didn't tell you Companies they wouldn't. do that sometimes. Uh, some, especially sometimes it, keep, it costs more money to just, you know, keep a stock of it on hand. <laughs> Which is, exactly. Well, yeah, with Ark's case, yeah. Yeah. Um, Florida Man writes in again and says, Hey, Tom, I've been enjoying your YouTube channel since before it had 10,000 subscribers. Ugh. Nice. And I figured it was about time I signed up for Patreon. So here I am. I recently got a deal on an AIB 6950 XT from Micro Center for $700. According to Tech Power Up, this is about double the performance of the 1080 Ti. Uh, yeah, because this 5700 XT was slightly weaker than the 1080 Ti, mm -hmm. and then this is slightly better than the uh, 6900 XT that was double the 5700. So yeah, no, I, it is probably double the performance, if not a little more than double. He says, what year would you estimate another doubling of performance at the $700 price point? It seems like it took us seven years or six years to get there from 2017 to 2023. <laughs> I think it's plausible this happens in three years, but I wouldn't bet on it happening before five years. And it, a lot of this is yeah. inflation, though, too. I, I mean, I think the, the bet you're making, like, do you think it's realistic that RDNA 4 will double 6950 XT for 70? For, for I'd say RDNA 5. No, I, I think that's the bet. Like, do you think that's possible? I think pretty unlikely. So probably RDNA 5 is when that would happen. Maybe RDNA 6 if we're in the darker timeline. But Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, do I think it's going to take six years again? No. Do I think it's going to take two years? No. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably at least five, though. I think four to five, yeah. Um, all right. Now let us move on to the worst price thing we've seen in a very, very long time. <laughs> Uh, story number four, RTX 4070, 4060, and 4050 laptops get reviewed. Last news episode, we discussed the launches of the RTX 4090 and 4080 laptop chips. And yeah, we found them to be very efficient, but so overpriced that it almost didn't matter. With the 4070 and 4060 laptop chips, it's honestly, well, it's even worse. Not only is the 4070 more expensive in the laptops we're seeing than the old 3070 laptops and the 4060 than the old 3060 laptops, with the 4050 chip basically being priced at the same level as the old 3060 laptops with worse performance, we can just say that overall mid-range laptop performance has completely stagnated. That's right. The 4070 laptop chip effectively dies the 3070 Ti laptop chip at best and even offers the same efficiency when both are around 120 watts, confirming the leaked performance from Moore's Law is dead a couple weeks ago. And the 4060 seemingly ties the 3060 with the 4050, losing to the 3060 notably at the same price. So really, what else is there to say? NVIDIA has completely stagnated laptop gaming and only arguably increased efficiency and performance at the top at the top end of laptops if you spend over $2,500 anyways. Yay. That's my summary glancing at this. I think you took more time to look at the reviews out there. Am I wrong? Would you tweak what I've said about these in any way? Um, I, I, I would, the way I think I would put it is the 4070, depending on the game, it's Somewhere between a 3070 Ti and a 3080 Ti laptop, usually. 4060 and 30, uh, 4050, I think, are about where you put them. Uh, there's not that much really uh, available right now. Like uh, you linked here, Jared Tech's review of the 4070, which I think is one of the best at, around right now. And then the most comprehensive, which is also linked, is the notebook check review, which. Yeah, they looked think, at all of them. I think a, a really major caveat needs to be put on the notebook check review when you're looking at it, though, um, because I think it, I think it reinforces your argument that the a, a, approximate uh, power level they're at is reinforced. So these in these 4070s, 4060 and 4050 they're looking at are all at 140 watts and they're comparing them to the average of every laptop they've tested for 
the mm. other GPUs. So you'll see that some of these things have like massive error bars because some of them are using like 40 watts and some of them are using 150 watts for their GPUs. So I think the best comparison is look at the top of the range for like each laptop you're looking at if you're lo- wanting to look at a fair p- power com- uh power per power i mean watt for watt comparison versus mm-hmm. the laptops they tested which if you do that you, that's basically where you land is like the 4070 is a 3070 ti the 4060 is a little better than a 3060 to a 3070 and then the 30 4060 is i don't i mean the 4050 is uh piece of crap <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> a 96 bit piece of shit they're selling for thir- mid-range prices yeah um so okay am i another way to put what you said though your your critique to what i said in the beginning basically is well look a lot of 3070 and 3070 ti laptops are limited to like 75 80 watts in those scenarios the 4070 actually is almost a 3080 ti if it's yeah. at 80 watts but if you're at 150 watts it sometimes loses to the 3070 laptop yeah Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess most of the stuff I looked at was at the top end of it. Yeah. And, know, and so, and, and to be fair to critique whatever the hell it, it, this NVIDIA has done with their naming, it's almost impossible to discuss their uh, laptop GPUs without caveating the hell out of everything because <laughs> they're every single one of their GPUs is like a 50% change in performance depending on how uh, they're binned and they're called the same thing which is nuts well yeah i mean the 4070 laptop i think can go down to 35 watts it's just not going to be the same as uh, i don't have a <laughs> I, I mean but it's like i don't have a problem with them having a max q that's 65 watts if you say max q but the second you put it in 35 watt mode it's like well guys you're running at a third the clock speed here <laughs> this is yeah and clock speed's very important for lovelace considering how small these dies are yeah, it's just, it's so difficult to talk about their GPUs, which is why I think like uh, the Jared Tech review is good to look at for the 4070. And there doesn't seem to be that many, at least as the time of recording, there's that many like 4060 or 4050 uh, benchmarks out there right now. Uh, but his, I think he does, it, it's a pretty good apples to or apples comparison. Obviously, there's no perfect apples to apples comparison with any GPU uh, laptop GPU because the OEMs are going to pair them with what they're going to pair them with. Yeah, I, I I agree that I think what Jared's tech really excels at and he comes on the channel about once a year is trying to make it apples to apples so you know <laughs> what you're talking about theoretically if you say 4070 laptop and kind of trying to remove as much of the noise as possible and go. This is what it's like at this TDP if you see it labeled this on a laptop. <laughs> yeah, because that that's another big problem though is if like you can say stuff like the 4070 is more expensive than the 3070 Ti and that means it's a regression in performance. But then also most of the 4070 laptops that come out have a better CPU, better RAM, better right. solid state drive. So it's like, yeah, this is like 2800 versus a $2200 3070 Ti laptop. But the 4070 laptop also has twice as much RAM, twice as much storage, and a generation newer i9. So yeah, you're you're you are paying eight hundred dollars more for something besides the GPU at least. Yeah, I guess, but I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's and I, I I think the average GP uh, laptop with a 4070 is decently more expensive than a 3070 Ti though. Still, yeah, it's. It's just so depressing, but it brings us back to the previous story that we had, uh, number uh, three, which is AMD has to go for market share, and I'm going to be blown away if they don't. And look at it, guys. The, the the die sizes I leaked for 8106 and 107 with actual pictures, so no surprise it turned out correct, did turn out correct. You know, the 4060 and 4050 GPUs used around i think they're 155 millimeter squared dies Mm -hmm. i mean we're talking about 1050 ti sized dies yeah like that they're selling a 60 class and it seems like the like navi 33 
probably can beat that performance, at least in the higher TDP configurations, with a 200 millimeter squared six nanometer die. So that is 200 of six versus 155 millimeter squared of four. That thing probably mm-hmm. costs a lot, decently less to make. Man, you got to put this in one thousand dollar laptops that barely match the forty seventy at some TDPs AMD. Oh, like, oh yeah, <laughs> put it with Phoenix. Thousand dollars, Phoenix seventy six hundred MXT fourteen inch form factor, one grand. Give it a good screen, and and I think those will sell like hotcakes because this hole in the market. And AMD will be making higher margins than last gen doing that, so they're not oh, even yeah. that that generous. It's like they. And they've just bought a bunch of capacity, guys. They have to go for market share. So as much as we're saying everything sucks sometimes, let's wait for the year to end. I don't think this story (laughs) is over. I don't. Um, Jessie here may know how to fetch very well, but she really hasn't learned one of the main things any viewer of Moore's Law is Dead should know by now, and that's that you don't need to overpay for Microsoft keys. This piece of content is brought to you by cdkeyoffer.com. There's just no reason to pay exorbitant monopolistic prices for Microsoft Office or Microsoft operating systems anymore. Not when you have someone like cdkeyoffer.com, who's been a fantastic sponsor of Moore's Law is Dead for many years now if you're looking for anything from steam games origin games you play games or playstation keys or reasonably priced microsoft software go to cdkeyoffer.com today click the links in the description and use the offer codes broken silicon for 25 percent off microsoft keys and die shrink for three percent off everything else on the website don't be like jesse here who's chewing on my chair right now be smart don't overpay for online software and go to cdkeyoffer.com today All right. Speaking of an evolving story, let us move on then to story number five. AMD working on machine learning accelerated FSR that only works on RDNA 3 for now. All right. We'll be brief. This channel got a report that AMD is indeed working on machine learning acceleration to a future version of FSR that currently can only be utilized by RDNA 3. This was something heavily hinted at and even teased directly by Moore's Law is Dead in the past year. But now we can say, yeah, it does actually seem to be happening, at least in AMD's labs. Details outside of that are scarce to us, at least. I don't know if someone else knows something. But I will say that this writer at least hopes that AMD makes a 3D chess move here, maybe 4D or 5D chess move, Dan, Mm. then makes a future version of FSR that not only gets accelerated by new machine learning hardware in RDNA 3, but leaves open source options for Intel and NVIDIA to accelerate these features as well. AMD could step back and invite the competition to support the open standard saying, hey, if you guys care about your customers, we've added support for Tensor Core's NVIDIA if you want to help contribute to FSR in open standard. And meanwhile, this might help AMD get more market share with game devs implementing a standard that all architectures can leverage with machine learning enhancements in all games while knowing that they have a head start on having the most optimized acceleration because they created it. Um, So yeah, I mean, AMD is working on machine learning accelerated versions of FSR. I think we all knew they probably would do that eventually. Right now, Mm -hmm. it utilizes some of the new hardware in RDNA 3 that RDNA 2 doesn't have. And speaking with some people, and this is where we get into speculation, not leaks, uh, I think for FSR to really destroy DLSS, it needs to not just be competing for having a similar amount of games that support it, but to really have it in more games. And it's an open source, you know, standard. Mm -hmm. Add the inputs for Tensor Cores and say, hey, devs, we even put a few optimizations for NVIDIA's Tensor Cores. NVIDIA, it's an open standard. If you want to uh, support the standard, you can, or explain to your fans why you're not doing it. I think that's the key to making this really end the DLSS discussion. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that makes sense for a, a strategy as a smaller company, you know, to get their software integrated into more games. Just, you know, give it to NVIDIA as well, I guess. And... You know, beyond that, if they're working on a machine learning accelerated DFSR, I guess that gives me a little bit more hope that something like uh, their fra- uh, what are they calling it, fluid frames or whatever, gives yeah. me a little more hope fluid that that's motion, not, I think frames yeah, that, that that's not going to be just a really bad interpolation thing that, and hopefully, 
that will actually use machine learning so it won't look like a uh, complete shit like i was <laughs> like i was kind of assuming it was when they initially announced it mhm yeah um i i think and i just think again kind of bringing it all full circle to what we're talking about here you know where's mid range rdna3 what are they going to do it's like i think they're still working on like a big rollout of the next gen of fsr in conjunction with some more driver optimizations for rdna3 and they want to announce those before they launch their mid-range because Mm -hmm. it is kind of a huge selling point though if like i don't think so far it's an important feature but some people do if the 4070 ti can say hey this supports dlss and dlss3 uh and this other card from amd doesn't and you don't need it for the 4090, but in the mid-range, you actually probably are going to be turning on upscaling at all times. Mm-hmm. I think AMD wants to make sure they have the best options to combat that before they try to make the argument for like whatever they're going to price their cards at. Mm-hmm. Um, all righty. So that is all of the main stories. That's it. Five main stories on this one. Thank God we waited for X3D. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> this would have been a 40 minute episode. <laughs> yeah. But uh, let us move on to the wrap up. There are a few things here uh, to go through. So I already mentioned it. Uh, I My 80, 106, and 107 leaks of the dies. Someone else uh, just leaked the same looking dies. So there it is. Correct. Didn't make that up. <laughs> um, and that was, D- um, that was uh, Sky Juice was sharing it. Well, right? Yeah. Angstronomus oh, oh, okay. was sharing it, though. Okay. So yeah. Never mind. I misread that then. Um, also, let's see here. The 4070 12 gigabyte die is pictured. So, as things continue, it does seem like the rumors of a 10 gigabyte 4070, it seems like Nvidia is going to probably go with 12 gigabytes. Um, I don't really have anything else besides that to say. <laughs> I guess that's <laughs> and there, better. <laughs> and there have been rumors swirling, swirling, squ- swirling around, or swirling, whatever. Squirrely rumors swirling around that. Arrow Lake might be delayed to 2025, uh, which I think uh, my timeline I've said is I believe it's coming out mid to quarter three next year. Um, At least right now, guys, all I can communicate is the people I talk to say it's not delayed. So for Mm -hmm. now, I wouldn't take it as Arrow Lake's delayed. Obviously, this is Intel. Anything can happen with Intel when it comes to delays. Anything can be delayed. <laughs> but if it does, I will say, if it comes out 2025, that means it's almost competing with Zen 6. And I don't, not good for <laughs> Intel. I mean, what do you want me to say? Yeah. It's like half of my Intel analysis is just like, I don't know if this happens. It's disastrous. Bad, 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 bad. So, <laughs> but from what I've heard, you shouldn't double down on that happening yet, which is good news for gamers. Um, all right. Now, let us move on then to the final reader mails. Forbidden Juice writes in and says, Hello, Tom and Dan. I finally replaced my i7-4770K build from high school with a 7950X a few months ago. (laughs) This is quite an upgrade. (laughs) It runs max load 24-7, by the way. However, since I have still have my 1080p screen, I kept the RX 6600 I got based on your pricing input recently. And my question is, what would you think the best 4K monitor is right now or coming soon? And what card would you hypothetically pair with such a monitor? I've always been at 60 hertz, so not looking to go blazing fast as anything's going to be an upgrade over this in frame rates. But I imagine 144 hertz wouldn't be silly. I'm guessing OLEDs are still just too expensive to make sense. But I do look to keep it for six years or more. So I'd pay $1,000 or more. Uh, the main thing is I prefer 27 inch screens, but could be persuaded given enough reason to go to 32 inch. Thank you. Um, have you seen any good monitor deals recently? Uh, I mean, looking through Newegg, there didn't look like anything especially crazy. I mean, there looks like there's a pretty decent MSI monitor. Uh, what's it called? The MSI optics mag 28 uh a bunch of other crap behind it um that's 2160 by uh, 20 i mean 4k 144 hertz hdr 400 and that's 600 dollars right now so if you're not looking to spend a ton of money eh, that's not terrible the problem is if you're saying like a thousand dollars there's a weird gulf in pricing where it's like every 4k monitor is seemingly six to eight hundred dollars or fifteen hundred to two thousand yeah so 
I will. I'm looking around right now. It's the Alienware AW thirty four two three DW. This is a thirty four inch ultra wide fourteen forty p monitor. One seventy five hertz. So this is one seventy five hertz. If you like ultra wide, uh, which I think ultra wide is, you know, some people like it, some people don't. If you like ultra wide and you're willing to spend this much, I don't know, man. This is 175 hertz. The resolution is bigger than 1440p, but a little less than 4K. So mm-hmm. once you get a nice graphics card, you're going to max this sucker out <laughs> easily with like a 4090 would crush this. A 7900 XTX would crush this at 175 hertz. This is my recommendation outside of honestly, LG usually has some really good right now 170 hertz monitors that are ips for like 700 bucks and so i think it's kind of like pick your poison there are these mini led and like 1000 dimming zone monitors that seem to be around a thousand bucks now for six to seven hundred though you can get 170 hertz lg ips monitors that are quite an upgrade to what you have so it just depends like if you want to go for it you almost have the holy grail out now if it's there if you're okay with uh, ultra wide or you like that the holy grail is mm. here oled 1300 bucks 175 hertz there it is man it's here um and but if be, you don't go uh, on oh uh, and, and then i was gonna say then beyond that if you want to look for a good deal or, or like a pretty good deal there's uh, i i just found a concept d uh 4k monitor for 500 bucks for, that's refurbished but I don't know if you want to save some money and get a refurbished part. That's always an option. Is it? What's the model name on it? It's the CP3 271K. I think it might be what you had. That's what I want to know. I'm pulling up something here. Um, the CP3 271K. That is what I have. I got that for like 850. Okay. Almost three years ago. Now that's 600. 500. 500 yeah so the reason you would get that one and i overclocked mine to 132 hertz through a single display port so it's capable of that by the way just letting you know uh is it does have really good color accuracy mm-hmm. uh, but it basically doesn't have hdr is the yeah it has hdr 400 so it doesn't have hdr <laughs> <laughs> i tested it it didn't look better it looked worse so i'm like your okay. monitor which i think honest to god does look better with hdr turned on oh, yeah. um so yeah i mean Uh, The Concept D, if you need to do editing, I think is a good budget option. I would otherwise probably spend the extra $200 on LG's new HDR monitors, you know. You're probably right. I just want to give a range of options. (laughs) Yeah. And again, it's like a lot of this stuff, though, like you're saying, though, yeah, it's like $500. Honestly, man, you have a 1080p 60 monitor. Everything's an upgrade. So I'm tempted (laughs) to just say, get one of these now. And if you want to wait, well, I don't know. How many monitors do you want? I have two 4K displays and then a 1080p one over here that I've had for over. over a decade. I don't <laughs> And, you know, so you have this 1080p. I assume you'll put it to the side. You'll get the 4K one now and use that. And if you only spend $600 now or something, just keep in mind that in a couple of years, OLED 4K will be here and then you can have your two 4K displays. So that's kind of the advice I would give based on literally that's what I did. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you can't, there's a lot now's a good time to get a monitor in general and i think we gave you a lot of good options yeah um dragonaut writes in and says hi tom and dan i've been looking to buy a steam deck for a while but it's simply not available in norway at least are they possibly replacing it with a steam deck 2 anytime soon or when do you think it will be back in stock uh it's pretty widely in stock in the u.s i don't think a new steam deck's coming out for i mean me and uh nx gamer talked about and he has actually really good sources we don't think a new one's coming out with new new with a better a really better CPU for at least a year. I think they're just going to want to make them for now. So it depends. Do you want it now? Eh, get it now. Uh, and I guess that I'll, I'll just add like a just because it's Valve, you never know if Valve is just going to like lose interest in something and then just. Never I don't make think they escape. will with this one, but okay. that is true. I, I don't think I, I just will, always have to say mention that with Valve though, because they they just lose interest in projects and forget about them. Half the like time. Steam machines, yeah, yeah. But this is like if Steam machines worked. So that's true. I, I, I think they're going to stick to this one. 
And also, don't ignore some of the other stuff out there. There was I I had a I've I'm a I've sponsor had a sponsorship from them before. There was that portable gaming people that have like a Vega three, like two hundred dollar mm-hmm. port. Like yeah, that's a lot weaker than the Steam Deck. It's like a third of the performance. And they're making a Mendocino based one too, with just two RDNA two compute units. But the things like. I think 200 bucks, they'll play Minecraft. So it just depends what you want. And then there's there's Phoenix uh, and Rembrandt-based gaming uh, handhelds coming out that are stronger than the Steam Deck 2 for like $1,000. So just keep in mind, too, if you want something better, eh, there are options out there. Like if the Steam Deck's selling for double MSRP in Norway, I would look for the other options that are $1,000 with better performance. Granted, yeah, you know, you want to make sure it supports... Steam OS uh, or the Steam Deck's operating system, so you get those optimizations. But you know, I I, I think there might be other good options there. And by now, um, TMC Paint writes in and says, "Would you wager an Xbox Series X that Sony launches a PS5 refresh by quarter four 2023? Would you wager a PS5 Digital Edition on Microsoft releasing refreshes the Series X or Series S by Q4 2023 as well?" Well, it depends what you mean by refresh. Sony's already using 6 nanometer in the PS5, and they've retooled the PS5 every year. So mm-hmm. technically, I'd win this wager by my arguments, uh, by what I would argue if I said yes right now. Otherwise, yeah, I think I, we're getting a slim PS5 this year, and we're going to get Xbox refreshes by the end of this year. Actually, NX Gamer made an interesting point last episode that although I was told the 6 nanometer Series S should come out first, they never made a big announcement for the six nanometer PS5, and they kind of just started arriving when the other stock ran out of stock. There's a chance if Xbox already has the six nanometer chips, but they haven't sold through their stock yet. Yeah, I, I, I mean that usually that's usually a thing these companies silently do, though, without making a big deal about it, right? I mean, usually, if I'm remembering correctly, usually like the slim versions of consoles usually mark like a a node shrink of the uh, die they're using, but and, and I, I'd be surprised if there isn't a slim PS5 and slim Series X this year because three years in, that's generally when they release that, right? <laughs> yeah. So, in fact, I, I'm surprised they're not out yet, but I think there's they have their reasons for not doing it yet. I think actually Sony took an interesting approach where they're like, "Hey, we have the cheaper die now. Let's just throw it in the chassis, get rid of those, and then mm-hmm. what we do, we don't need to hold these dies for the slim. We can launch that and then work the slim around it and launch it in the middle of 2023, which I think they're going to launch it probably bef- maybe before fall from the sounds of it. Um, all right. Jensen Wang writes in again and says, "Following on an X Gamers discussion on a lazy pro console, couldn't Sony just add a new power table for their newer SOCs, which would enable the SOC to maintain its boot peak boost clock for variable FPS in games without interfering with their development at all? Uh, yeah, they could. And that's an argument I made. Like, even if it seems like in a recession, it doesn't make sense to go for like a $700 five nanometer pro console anymore. I think there's an argument they could still just, I mean, literally they almost have like twice as fast GDDR6 they could put on this die mm-hmm. and then just enable all cores, give it a faster clock and give it like a PS5 Pro gear mode. And you could honestly boost performance by 50% and there'd be relatively little you need to do with how many games use variable refresh rates now on console. Having said that, though, next Gamer made an interesting argument that, well, right, but if you use faster GDDR6, you can also then just clock it lower and use lower voltage and have a smaller heat sink and have a cheaper PS5 base anyways. So yeah. it's hard to say what they will do. Yes, they could launch a Pro, Sony could right now, and, and certainly Xbox could with a 6 nanometer Series X that clocks faster and has 20 gigabytes of RAM. They could boost performance 50% like that. <laughs> but yeah. is it worth it to them? I think for the Xbox it is because I think segmenting the memory was a bizarre bozo idea where if they just had four more gigabytes of RAM and then think about it, Dan, they make the RAM 50% faster. You double bandwidth effectively on the Series X, clock it a little faster and you have very little you need to do because they don't program as close to the metal as Sony. That gives them some disadvantages. But in this case, that means it would probably be easy to update games to boost frame rates and resolutions across the board, and then they could finally argue they have the strongest console. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I'm surprised that they haven't 
on Microsoft's part, at least, I'm surprised they haven't launched like a full refresh yet. Just because I, I, I thought that they were going to be moving to, like when they first announced it, I thought they were going to be moving to like a maybe even two year refresh schedule where they would just have rolling updates. Yeah, I remember we talked about that. Which I guess I was wrong about. We'll see if the it's just going to be three years instead, which eh, that's not that much of a difference, I guess. But <laughs> yeah. I will say this about the PS5 too. Like, I don't know. I just, I don't need a stronger console personally. And I'm fine with what I have now. Yeah. And I would prefer, I know they've got the concept and the overall design for the PS5 uh, Pro done. They have it, guys. Like, I, I'm not backing down on that, but I never was confirmed that they would for sure release it, although I thought they would. That was before recession. Now that we're in a recession, I have to reevaluate my opinion and I go, I just would rather like an RDNA five console in 2025. Like yeah. just bring something six times better that fundamentally does it again with backwards compatibility. And we don't need this pro shenanigans. Last gen was more awkward. This gen, everything's smooth. They don't need it. Yeah, I agree. Um, Carmen cry writes in, will you wager having to record one podcast episode using a Nashville Southern accent? On the Nintendo Switch 2 releasing before a PS Vita 2? Well, that would be a complete disaster. So even if I get this wrong, there's no way. But I'll say two things. <laughs> Nintendo Switch 2? Yeah. That's going to come out in probably within a year. In fact, a lot of people think exactly a year from now, basically. Like spring 2024. No, and we've talked about why it has to. Yeah, the only way a Switch 2 doesn't come out is if it, Nintendo commits to their idea of never... Can, can having a consistent uh, platform that they release things on and r- decides to ruin a good thing because they they can't make a new console that they can't make a new console that doesn't just completely throw out the old design <laughs> yeah like there's not a lot here guys bring out something 10 times better which let's be clear about that would still probably only be around a series s at best maybe even a little <laughs> weaker but you know do it give it an okay screen and sell that for four hundred dollars done another more another billions roll in another hundred million so yeah so i think that, that that you know i've done leaks about that that's coming the, the P- playstation vita 2 was canceled they had one and uh yeah. all i can say is i know someone who had it like a prototype i can't i won't say more than that because i was told not to but they had a vita 2 it was called the vita 2 it was canceled and there's no whispers of some follow-up to that coming anytime soon right now. And I think this was a video I did last year. I maintain the best thing a, a Sony could do if they wanted a portable console is just die shrink with some tweaks, maybe, the PS4 to like three nanometer and make a five watt, P, literally PS4, so that backwards all games with backwards compatibility to the PS4 run on it. <laughs> you know, and then... Boom, you just have a portable PS4 and you give it a decent enough CPU and then you tell devs, hey, 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 it has the same IO and CPU as the PS5, right? It'll take some work, but fundamentally, you should be able to make a 720p version of any PS5 game with this console if you do a few things. Mm -hmm. That's what I think Sony should do if they ever did a follow-up. Either that or just a gaming smartphone again. But even then, I'm like, "Eh." so... That's the best options. Vita 2 was a concept and it was canceled. Oh, um, yeah. I, that, I don't think that's a shock to anyone. I, I, just, I don't think uh, Sony's making another handheld probably ever. May, mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe and if some, they do, they can't have it have its own gaming library. It just has to share the PlayStation yeah. 4 and 5 library. <laughs> maybe, maybe five or ten years from now, something crazy happens and they decide to give it another go, but I don't think that would be a Vita 2 exactly. No. No, and it would be cool if it was a portable PS4 uh, with the exclusives having a PS5 option, as like having mm-hmm. those games as well in 720p. I think that'd be cool, but that's the only thing that even remotely makes sense to me. <laughs> um, all right, Dan, well, that's it. I mean, that's all the entire episode. I want to thank you for recording this with me in the middle of the night. It's just... Mm-hmm. One of those days. Um, and I guess, you know, I'll just do the usual spiel. 
Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Like, subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on a podcast app of choice so we get downloads there. That really helps. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts and your podcast app of choice if it isn't Apple Podcasts. So it helps a ton. We're, I've seen us climbing in the technology podcast charts recently. You know, a, few, a couple of years ago, we were in the top 20 technology podcasts on earth. Let's try to get there again this year, guys. And <laughs> otherwise, just remember, you get this podcast early and ad free on uh, Patreon. You get to submit questions for me and for guests. You get Die Shrink. One just came out looking at what VRAM requirements will be in a few years. That's only for patrons, always ad free. Get the Discord, free reader mails on loose ends. Uh, if we hit the next Patreon goal, uh, we will be doing ad-free video early releases of content as well to the Patreon. The goal is just to have early ad-free releases, but I need someone to help me manage all this stuff, guys. And so if we get to the next Patreon, we can afford to do it. Please help us get to the next Patreon goal. And otherwise, uh, again, thanks for listening. Thank Take you. care of yourselves. Yeah. This podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me, and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Law is Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, it's not just me. Moore's Law is Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, renders being done by the industrial designer Jean-Philippe Clermont, and special assistance is also provided by Carmen Cry and Kerry Nosugad as well. Find all of our information at www.moreslawisdead.com on the about slash support page in the event you do want to hire me for consulting work, hire Gerard for audio work, hire Jean-Philippe for industrial design work, or you're interested in working with Carbon Cry or Kerry No Sugata as well. You can also find our long-term sponsors on that page if you want to show them some love for putting food on our tables. Or you can also mail us some love. You can send letters or hardware donations to the following address. Moore's Law is Dead, P.O. Box 60632 in Nashville, Tennessee, zip code 37206. Although, to be honest, the best way to show Moore's Law is Dead some love is to support us on Patreon. Patrons are what makes Moore's Law is Dead content truly possible. Every month and really every day, depending on who you're talking about, me, Gerard, Dan, and John Philippe are working tirelessly to provide a steady stream of content that we could not keep doing unless we knew the work was possible without being reliant on sponsors dictating every little thing we put out. Don't get us wrong. We love our sponsors, but we love directly working for you, our fans, much more. If you have any extra money, even a couple free dollars a month, consider supporting us directly on Patreon. Those couple of monthly dollars will get you access to the exclusive podcast Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to ask guests questions, and of course, access to the Moore's Laws Dead Discord full of like-minded people who I am sure would love to meet you. I am one of them. Additionally, higher tiers get access to early, ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the ability to ask questions in all Broken Silicon episodes and loose ends live streams ahead of the recording, and the entire back catalog of Moore's Law Z podcasts, in addition to having thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts depending on the tier with other perks available as well. And hey... If you cannot afford to support us directly every month, please do share Moore's Law is Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family and on social media and websites like Reddit. And give Broken Silicon a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast app of choice. All of this does really help us so much. But like I said, this podcast would not be possible without it, the patrons directly providing predictable and reliable support every month. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. The following supporters are at the 10 gigahertz or higher supported levels. Brad Medlin, Drita Full, AV, Anthony Graffa, Greg Pataki, Muhammad Akwari, Brett Jones, Aaron Close, Little Germany, Dan Rauner, Daniel Hyde, Treadbird, Brian Riggleman, Dr. Forbin, Sam Miller, Deke, Josh Law, and the Mechanical Philosopher, Terrence Herod. SNES Chalmers, Tom Bailey, Greg T. Wanchik, Andrew S., Frank Zielinski, Daniel D., MJB1, Eric Jackson, Justice Brennan, Joshua L. Herrera, Valko Malev, The Boss Haas, Nicholas Buckner, Spantrum G. Spantrum, Jonathan, Lord Starstream, General Drips, Blake, Franco Frederick, Matthew Lazier, Jensen Wang, Nathan Mose, Aziris, Greg S. Acker, Dominic Cock, Jake Dude 23, Jake Martin, Karen, Venti CZ, Hardforum.com, Original Ross, Slicky, Lance Bassler, David Cowden, Ricky Tan, Chris Frey Butler, GZ Ziggy, Sarcastro, Stefan Hart, David Sebastian, Meet and Pork Stew, Tim Robb, Luis Correa, Ian Clifford, Jesse Jeskowiak, 
Travis Gooding, Holden Mobley, Nanian, Chris Rich, Deepest Learners, Mad Zutsu Taylor, Stephen Coates, Michael McGee, Chuck Glidden, Sammy Malas, Greg, AWS Danny, Patrick Grow, Amy Will Chief, Brett Summers, Milton, Stephen Dick, Tommy, John, Brucha, Mark Mitchell, Mac Daffy, AC, James Anderson, Marshall Pierce, Mark Raidmaker, Dave Schultz, 3DS Boy 08, Hal Buma, Narithio, Matthew Landavazo, Stefan, Cole Attic, Henry Zhang, Judson N, Keith Moore, The Grin, Michelle Pell, D31337, Antics, Joseph Kelly, Earth Taurus, Exapuma, Chrysantine, Jim Ferrier, RV Racer, Keith Moore, Kita, Abdul. Kadar, Precision, DNA Tech, Radon, Radeon Technologies Group, Jean O'Shea, Royce Meyer, Charles Russell, Reginald Ari, Slushpaw, Teak Autumn, Jackson Miller, JSMMH, Neithra Zink, Me and Dean Cal, Andre Jacques, Gaiman Since Reagan, Jeff Sedler, Jordan Simkovic, Loophole 35, Winstar William Wellplea, James I. Raider, Corey Leonard, Neil Lima, John Chin, Justin Bussell, Kelvin, Austin Hagerty, Roger Davies, Jay Julian Leaked, Corey Chappelle, Evan Dingle, C2, John Iverson, Michael Aaron, The Eternal Dreamers, Jansen and Gima, Hingsagun, Derek Lambing, and of course, thank you to Sahara for the music. <laughs>